Okay. Good evening, everybody. I can see we have almost 100 people attending the meeting in spite of the early hours in 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 Anna's uh, 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 California. So uh, today I'm super happy to to have here Anna Molovsky, an impressive researcher with a really amazing record of publications, super exciting data that she's going to be sharing with us today. And before we do anything, uh, let me share with you our next uh, calendar. Right? Yes. Sorry. Sorry, here. So just remember that this is a team of people organizing from the University of Lausanne, Rosa Paulicelli and Cliff Compagnon, Giorgio Corsi and Gloria Colombo, and from Achucarro, myself, Fede Soria and Marta Pereira. We have more upcoming talks that are super interesting. Joao Relvas will be joining us in December, Michelle Monge in January, and Gilbert Di Paolo in February. Just remember that you have access to all the recorded talks, which are the vast majority here in this, in this uh, website. And you can also follow us on Twitter or join the, the email list uh, to get uh, all the announcements of the meetings. So without further ado, I'm going to let Marta to introduce uh, Anna, and then Fede will be handling the questions and answers. So thank you everybody for coming. Hello everyone, it's my great pleasure to introduce Anna Molovsky. She's a molecular neuroscientist and adult psychiatrist. Her research group studies the functional connections between the immune system and the brain to understand how immune signals shape healthy brain function throughout life. She has identified several novel mechanisms through which cytokines such as interleukin-33, type 1 interference, and interleukin-13 regulate brain development and synaptic plasticity. These studies demonstrate that distinct aspects of neural circuits can be regulated by different immune, immune pathways with implications for many diseases in which the immune system might be involved, including schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorders, and others. She has received several awards, including an NIH New Innovator Award, a Pew Biomedical Scholar Award, and the Freeman Prize from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. So this is it. Um, the screen is yours. Yeah. Yes, please remind to turn off your cameras, maybe, because sometimes there is problems with the connectivity, and then we can turn them on again for Anna, to join Anna during the questions. Thank you. Go ahead, Anna. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Very nice to be here. Um, and I'm sharing my screen. Now. Let's see. Okay. Um, everything all right? Yes. Good. All okay. Um, so yeah, great to be here. Uh, I'm Anna Malofsky, and I'm going to talk today about how cytokines uh, regulate the function of microglia and can elicit distinct functional states. Um, so let me change here to show my laser pointer. So we know uh, that the immune system is involved in many different neurological and psychiatric diseases, um, many more than we had originally envisioned, right? So um, I think neuroimmunology really began with the study of multiple sclerosis um, many years ago. And, I th and now we know that, for example, Epstein-Barr virus, which is a B cell infecting virus, can increase the risk of multiple sclerosis 30 fold. Uh, we have therapies in the clinic that can really do incredible things to prevent progression of multiple sclerosis um, via uh, suppression of B cells. Uh, and you can see a field coming from be trying to understand uh, a neuropathological lesion to being able to treat those lesions with immunotherapy. Um, how could we get to the same place uh, for other brain diseases? For example, uh, we think of post-viral neurological syndromes, including the one caused by this virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, long COVID and many others. Um, how do we understand what's going on in the brain uh, at the level of the immune system? Um, we think of course about neurodegenerative disease. Here's uh, several microglia surrounding an amyloid plaque. Uh, um, immune activation is a major feature uh, of um, diseases like Alzheimer's. Um, I think, as a psychiatrist, I think a lot about uh, schizophrenia and other uh, psychiatric conditions in which we know that the immune system plays a link. Uh, here you see that the top hit 
in the Manhattan plot of the first genome-wide association study of schizophrenia is the class one MHC locus. Uh, we don't know what this means yet, but it clearly means that the immune system is involved. Um, and many of these diseases, particularly uh, psychiatric ones, uh, begin in neurodevelopment. Uh, and there's been beautiful work uh, beginning to show how maternal cytokines can cross the placental barrier to impact the development of the brain. Um, and so we are interested in understanding this uh, from a mechanistic perspective. Uh, and one way that my lab has been thinking about this a lot is from the perspective of cytokines. Uh, and so here's kind of my very brief summary of how the immune system works. Uh, uh, most of how the immune system impacts cells and tissues is via the release of these solubile factors called cytokines. We have three main arms of the immune response, uh, and they are promoting the health of the body uh, by balancing each other out, so to speak. And we discovered them originally based on the types of pathogens that elicit those immune responses. Uh, so bacteria, for example, uh, type 317 immune responses, viruses with type 1 responses, and allergens uh, with type 2 responses. Each of those responses has a, a cadre, kind of array of canonical cytokines that are induced, um, including interferons, IL-413 signaling, and IL-17. Um, there's also cytokines that we may all have heard of um, for example, TNF and IL-1 family members, which are more uh, IL-6, which are more general inducers of inflammation. Uh, but I, my lab has mostly been thinking about these cytokines that are very unique uh, to these well-defined types of immune responses. So that's one way to think about it, right? These are immune responses that are elicited by pathogens. And another way that I think the field has been thinking about it quite a bit is that when you have these immune responses, we occasionally end up in this excess immune response state, a pathological feed-forward loop, where the cytokine itself can begin to cause disease, right? Uh, so one very clear example of this is psoriasis, which is a rash uh, that can be caused by excess IL-17 activity. What I really want to highlight here is the blockade of IL-17 signaling is essentially curative uh, for psoriasis. Uh, I even had a colleague applying for a grant in this area uh, where it was uh, noted to him, well, you know, haven't we already cured psoriasis? Why do we need to study it? Um, that's how effective some of these immunotherapies can be. Um, therapies in development for asthma and eczema target uh, IL-413 signaling. And so I think a major question here is, you know, why don't we have more immunotherapies for neuropsychiatric diseases, right? Um, I think that uh, MS is one great example, but there's the opportunity for many more if we can really understand um, how cytokines are impacting the brain. Um, and so this comes to my sort of third perspective on how we can think about the immune system uh, and cytokines uh, in the brain. And that is um, that cytokines and immune responses are constantly happening behind the scenes, not just in disease, to maintain the health of tissues. Uh, and that a healthy, um, brain is not an absence of immune signaling. It is a balance between these three different states of the immune system and probably many more states that I'm not describing here. Um, and so today I want to talk about two of those, two specific cytokines that regulate microglial function uh, in very different ways. Hold on a second. I'm just going to... Okay. So the first of those uh, is interleukin-33, uh, which is a cytokine that is upstream of type 2 or allergic immune responses. Uh, but in our studies, uh, plays a very unique role in shaping the function of microglia. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about interferons, uh, specifically type 1 interferons, uh, which are classically our antiviral cytokines, but also play a unique role in the healthy brain. Um, and to think more broadly about, you know, how do cytokines impact microglia, I just want to remind all of us uh, that microglia are exquisite sensors of the outside world, of the environment of the brain, and that the environment of the brain comprises, I would say, two major axes. Uh, the first is what I'm calling brain-associated molecular patterns. So uh, neurotransmitters like GABA and norepinephrine um, extracellular matrix, all of the patterns that are associated with the function of the healthy brain. Uh, and the second axis, which is what I'm talking about today, is instructive immune cues from cytokines. 
and microglia are integrating these two kinds of signals. They express pattern recognition receptors, not only the classical ones like toll-like receptors, but also you know, the brain-associated ones like uh, GABA-B neurotransmitter receptors and so forth that can acutely sense neural activity. They also express pretty much every cytokine receptor. And so um, the way that we've been thinking about it is that the combination of these two signals elicits distinct uh, functional states, uh, including a microglial functional state associated with synapse remodeling and a distinct microglial state associated with the engulfment of whole neurons. Um, and those are kind of the two axes that I'm going to talk about today. Um, in the first part of the talk, uh, how interleukin-33 drives a microglial remodeling state uh, via the extracellular matrix. Um, and I will apologize if some of this work has already been published. I thought today would be kind of a nice opportunity to um, not just show you the published literature, but really tell you how we're thinking about these findings, how we're interpreting them, and what we see as the future directions. Um, and so we are all familiar uh, with the idea that microglia can take up synaptic proteins. Uh, and here's um, a nice uh, example of this from uh, Greg Chin, who was a former technician in my lab. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to change this so that I can show the movie, but that's okay. Uh, and what you can see here is PSD95 in red and microglia uh, in cyan. Uh, and clearly it's been observed. Uh, many seminal studies in the field showed that synaptic proteins are taken up by microglia. And this was very exciting uh, because it was the first suggestion uh, that microglia might be involved in the process of neural circuit remodeling. Uh, and that has become a major area of excitement in the field. It is what drew me to the field of studying microglia as well. Um, but what we've been trying to understand is, you know, what's really going on? How do these synapse proteins end up inside of microglia? And what does it mean mechanistically in terms of function? Uh, and so in the first part of the talk, I'm kind of summarizing work led by many people in the lab, all of whom I have moved on, uh, including Raphael, Ilya, Fee, and Greg. Um, and it's about a cytokine named interleukin-33. Um, IL-33 is kind of a unique cytokine because it's expressed within the brain. It's not expressed by immune cells. It is made by stromal cells, tissue resident cells, including astrocytes, and as I'll show you later, by neurons as well. Uh, and what we showed in this very first study from my group is that interleukin-33 promotes microglial engulfment of synaptic material. And at the same time, it restricts excitatory synapse numbers. Uh, so what we found is that when we have IL-33 signaling, um, um, microglia engulf more synaptic proteins. Um, and at the same time, excitatory synapse numbers are restricted. Uh, and so this was my very first time studying microglia. When I saw these two phenotypes together, uh, we hypothesized that IL-33 is involved in the process of microglial synaptic pruning. Um, and we envisioned from this term pruning, which, you know, basically in English means the clipping off of synapses, you know, like, like this is we think of pruning like a, a tree or a bush. Um, and what I want to tell you today is that as we've studied this pathway in more mechanistic detail, um, we've changed very much our thinking about this process, so much so uh, that I no longer use this term. Uh, synaptic pruning, and I'll explain why in the next few slides. Um, so the reason we first began to question this initial hypothesis that microglia prune synapses and thereby restricted synapse numbers uh, had to do with our studies in the adult hippocampus. So we thought, okay, the adult hippocampus is undergoing lifelong synaptic remodeling, just like the developing brain is. All of our previous studies had happened in development. So is IL-33 involved in this process as well? Um, so we quickly began to realize that it's different. First, because astrocytes, which you can see here in green, are not the dominant source of IL-33 uh, in the hippocampus. Rather, it's actually neurons, which you can see here co-stained with nu -in. Um, But that's not the biggest difference. The biggest difference is here. So we began to quantify synapses in the adult hippocampus uh, by using dendritic spines as a surrogate. Um, and here you see a sparsely labeled neuron. Uh, and what we were most struck by, this is work by Fee Wen in the lab, 
is that in adulthood, IL-33 has the opposite effect. So instead of um, restricting synapse numbers, it actually increases synapse formation. So when we knock out IL-33 from neurons, uh, or when Phi knocked out the IL-33 receptor from microglia, we saw fewer synapses rather than more synapses. Um, and at the same time, he showed that knocking out either of these two components could lead to an impairment uh, in long-term memory consolidation. Um, so we know that it's involved in promoting synapse formation and it's involved uh, in promoting memory consolidation. There was one more piece of data, which I think really uh, helped us to think about this in a new way. Uh, and that was when Phi began to quantify a different feature of uh, dendritic spines, which are these so-called spine head filopodia. Uh, these are these small buds that uh, form from dendritic spines and are kind of a structural marker of synaptic plasticity. Uh, and we found that similarly to IL-33 deletion, um, deleting IL-33 here um, impacted dendritic spine plasticity. So here you can see spine head filopodia, and we see a reduction in spine head filopodia when we knock out dendritic spine, um, IL-33. Sorry. <clears throat> And the reason we did this study, uh, I want to say, and the reason we found this uh, really important is um, we had seen this really elegant paper from Cornelius Gross's lab that performed live imaging of microglial spine contacts. And here you see the microglial process in red and the spines in green. Uh, and after the microglial con microglia contacts the spines, uh, you can see essentially in real time the spine head filopodia forming right there. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that the neighboring spine uh, is also forming a filopodia. And this really got us thinking about these filopodial spines and it got us thinking about what happens when the microglia is contacting the spine. What are the molecular processes uh, that are occurring? Um, and more broadly, you know, thinking about this microglial spine contact and the fact that IL-33 is promoting synapse formation, uh, we, I, I was rereading this paper, this very famous paper by Roger Chen, where he proposed, uh, and remember, we had a memory phenotype in this study, uh, where he proposed that long-term memories might be stored in what he called the pattern of holes in the perineural net. Uh, and by perineural net, he was referring to the extracellular matrix of the brain. Uh, and we started to envision, you know, memory storage in the brain um, as basically this kind of, this is one of the very first forms of computer memory storage. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my dad was doing his postdoc uh, uh, graduate studies in Brazil in, um, uh, in physics, and data was still being encoded in these punch cards uh, where the holes themselves uh, are the data, right? And we began to imagine, you know, what if microglia are actually helping to punch some of these holes in the extracellular matrix to help encode memories? Um, and here's what the extracellular matrix of the brain actually looks like, just from the perspective of two markers. Uh, there are hundreds of proteins in the extracellular matrix, and you can see how incredibly heterogeneous it is across brain regions. Um, it is a latticework of many different proteins. Um, and we know from many, many elegant studies that extracellular matrix can both protect synapses and it can prevent the formation of new synapses. And in the hippocampus, uh, where we had been performing these studies uh, in, adult, in adulthood, there's a particular protein called agarcan, which is, is especially dense in this region. It is the dominant extracellular matrix protein in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. Uh, and so here's kind of the take home point um, of this first part of the talk, I would say, which is that, sure, if we look at engulfment of synaptic proteins by microglia, we can observe those. But if we look at engulfment of other types of proteins, we can see that as well. Uh, and here, what Phi found is that microglia engulf agarcan, which is the dominant extracellular matrix protein uh, in the ECM, here it is in the lysosome of the microglia, and that this process is dependent on interleukin-33. So when we knock out interleukin-33, this engulfment decreases. Um, and when we overexpress IL-33, uh, we can drive this process. Um, 
And so what I would want to say is that uh, we have now developed a model, and I would still call it a hypothesis because we haven't visualized all of these processes in real time, uh, whereby microbial contact with spines promotes clearance of the extracellular matrix in a manner that promotes synapse plasticity. Um, and I would even go so far as to say that engulfment is maybe the least interesting thing that microglia are doing in this setting. IL-33 is not driving a phagocytic program. It is not driving phagocytic receptors. Instead, it's driving receptors, pattern recognition receptors, which we think are involved in recognition of the extracellular matrix, although we're still working on, on showing this or testing this hypothesis. Um, it then drives a program of lysis of the extracellular matrix that clears these um, proteins and opens up space. And finally, it's only at the end of this two-stage process that those bits of extracellular matrix debris are engulfed. Um, and in fact, there's not a lot of engulfment receptors that are associated with this process. So um, what we've been focusing on is the mechanism through which um, microglia recognize the ECM and lyse the ECM. Um, and just to briefly allude to some unpublished work in the lab, uh, we've turned to the zebrafish, which is a beautiful model for live imaging um, brain development, um, based on some really uh, nice, uh, important work by Nick Silva, who um, is a postdoc in the lab and is starting his own group in January, uh, where he characterized microglia in the zebrafish brain and showed that in the hindbrain and the midbrain, um, we have a very unique population of synapse-associated microglia, right? Um, many of our studies in zebrafish are performed in the optic tectum, uh, where there's a lot of neuronal turnover and microglia are eating whole cells. Uh, but in the hindbrain, we have less neurogenesis, less neuronal turnover, uh, and we can observe microglia that are very similar to the microglia uh, in developing mammals uh, that are associating with synapses. Uh, and Haruna Nakaju in the lab has been performing live imaging of synapses in this region of the brain uh, using uh, beautiful tools that are very easily accessible in the zebrafish. And here you can see one of them uh, where we can label synapses using this finger construct uh, and, and these are hindbrain motor neurons uh, where we can uh, see individual synapses based on the clustering of PSD95 at the synapse. Um, and I just want to give you a brief teaser on the work that Haruna is doing right now, which we haven't submitted yet, uh, where she's visualizing the interaction of synapses with the extracellular matrix during development. Here you can see those same uh, PSD95 uh, synapses in pink. Um, the extracellular matrix is in gray. Uh, and I want to make one key point here, which is that the extracellular matrix is changing dramatically over the course of development. Here you can see the proteins, in this case, Brevican, that stabilizes the extracellular matrix. Um, and in development, extracellular matrix is very diffuse and dim. In adulthood, the extracellular matrix is dense. Uh, and so its function is going to vary based on whether you're studying the developing brain or the adult brain. In fact, Haruna did one very simple and elegant experiment where she digested the extracellular matrix with hyaluronidase and then looked at what happened to synapses. Uh, and really strikingly, I think, you can see that if you digest the extracellular matrix in development, excitatory synapses are lost. Whereas if you do the same exact experiment in the same brain region, looking at the same synapses in adulthood, um, we see that digestion of the extracellular matrix promotes synapse formation. So the ECM has an opposite impact on synapses, depending on the stage of development that you're examining. Um, and I think ultimately this is what explains why interleukin-33 had these opposite effects in development in adulthood. Um, so if we had stopped and said to ourselves, okay, you know, uh, interleukin-33 is a pruning molecule and had taken that observation at face value, I think uh, we would have missed uh, this much more fundamental role of IL-33, which is the digestion of the ECM. And I guess just to be um, a little bit provocative, because uh, I have the opportunity to do that here, um, I'll, I'll be the devil's advocate here and say that maybe... That's the main function of microglia. Maybe that's one of the only things they do to impact synapse remodeling uh, is to change the structure of the ECM. 
um, how much we could learn uh, from making that assumption and kind of pushing it as far as we can go. Um, I have laid out some of our thinking um, on this kind of whole field of microglial uh, synapse remodeling, which is a critical function of microglia, uh, in this very short uh, paper uh, that I uh, wrote together with Ukpong Ayo um, last December or last September. Um, and basically what we argue here is that microglia, and you know, we're not just the only ones to say this, I think many people, a large body of work has shown this, uh, microglia could impact synapses through a variety of different mechanisms. Um, the extracellular matrix destabilization of synapses, as I just told you about, which could lead synapses to be lost through neuron autonomous mechanisms and then cleaned up by microglia. Uh, engulfment of whole cells or debris, uh, trogocytosis, as has been shown by um, the Gross Lab and others, uh, and that this process of direct engulfment, which is what many of us envision when we hear the word pruning, um, may be one of only many mechanisms, and in fact is a mechanism that is very difficult to actually observe by live imaging. Uh, and so I would encourage us to really be open-minded about um, the potential functions of microglia uh, and identify how these all these different molecules that are regulating microglial function uh, are acting at the level of cell-cell and microglial synapse interactions. Um, so that's the first part of the talk related to how we believe interleukin-33 is driving the remodeling of synapses. Uh, and in the second part of the talk, I wanna talk about a completely different function of microglia, uh, which is their role in engulfing whole cells. Um, and in this case, whole neurons. Um, so this work was led by Leah Dorman in my group, together with Carolina Skubas, um, and with very, very essential inputs by Fi Wen, uh, Christian Lagares Linares, Haruna, and many, many other folks. Uh, and this work was just uh, published in April, uh, most of what I'm going to show you today. Uh, and, you know, when we started this study, we weren't really um, thinking so much about cytokines or uh, even microglia. We wanted to understand how glia are involved in dynamically responding to uh, extracellular signals in the brain. Um, and really we were wondering, you know, why is it that when you profile at the sing in this case with single nuclear or single cell sequencing, when you profile immune cells like lymphocytes or you profile uh, neurons, you get these very nice spatially distinct clusters um, marked by lineage defining transcription factors. They're stable over time. We have many different types of neurons, right? Um, and many of us who were involved in the that uh, white paper about microglial function uh, will remember that we spent uh, most of our meeting uh, discussing whether microglia are in states or types or subtypes, right? Uh, because when you do profiling of microglia, they really don't look that different from each other. They exist uh, in a variety of different states that are constantly changing. Um, and because they are transitioning rapidly between these states, they're exquisitely sensitive to their environment. Um, they may not look uh, all that heterogeneous when we profile them using approaches like single cell sequencing. And so Leah wanted to do an experiment to directly probe that hypothesis and to measure how microglia are responding to changes in the environment. Uh, and so we adapted a, a very, very well-known um, model in neuroscience, which has also been used by Dory Schaefer's lab uh, to study microglia. And in this case, what we did is we lesioned uh, less than half of the whiskers of the mouse uh, in early life, postnatal day two, um, so that synapses would rearrange, uh, but not be eliminated. Um, so as you probably know, when you lesion uh, uh, the sensory neuron under the whisker in early life, each of these barrels, which represents a single whisker in the barrel cortex, uh, expands to favor the spared whiskers and the regions where the whiskers were deprived uh, shrinks. And what Leah showed here is that the number of total number of synapses doesn't change. What changes uh, is the pattern of synapses. Uh, and so she went on to profile how microglia were responding to this perturbation by single cell uh, sequencing uh, and observed many changes, the most striking of which was the emergence of a type 1 interferon uh, microglial state, which you can see here marked uh, by the marker IFIDM3, which 
um, we found to be the most reliable um, marker of this uh, uh, type one interferon responsive state in the developing brain. Um, and I think um, a major turning point in the study was when we were able to visualize these microglia in the brain um, in C2. Um, and this was work done by Thi Wen in the lab uh, using uh, IFIDM3 protein staining uh, to visualize these microglia. Um, and one of the first things we observed is that these microglia are highly enriched in layer five of the developing cortex. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, and what was even more striking uh, is when Fee began to examine these microglia, uh, individual cells at high resolution, you can see a single one of these microglia here. What was most striking is that unlike the typical ramified morphology um, of microglia in development, these microglia were engulfing entire neurons uh, and even appeared to be engulfing cells, which um, based on their chromatin structure, I might say might still be alive, actually. We don't, this is something we're still trying to figure out. And what you can see, this microglia is reaching out across multiple cell diameters to capture this cell while it's in the process of digesting another one. Um, and here you can see that interferon responsive microglia are super eaters, so they're engulfing whole cells. Uh, and when they're engulfing, they are often, if not almost always, engulfing more than one cell at a time. Um, you can visualize, you know, I think one of the challenges for those of us that study phagocytosis is that it can be difficult to say, well, you know, is the cell eating too much or is it eating too little and it's kind of frozen in this phagocytic state? Uh, and I think that's where live imaging can be really helpful. And so here's an experiment by Haruna in the lab where she um, examined uh, microglial engulfment of cells in the optic tectum of the zebrafish, where this is a major function of microglia. And you can see that um, at postnatal uh, day 10, I think is what this is, a little bit later in development than where we often study zebrafish microglia, the microglia actually look quite ramified. They're contacting neurons shown here in red, um, but not engulfing. Uh, whereas when we drive type one interferon responses with poly IC, which is a viral mimetic, you can see that the microglia becomes highly phagocytic. It engulfs the neuron, um, and it retracts it towards its cell body. Um, we can do a similar experiment in the, um, in the mouse. Uh, here is an experiment done by Christian Lagares Lunaris in the lab, uh, where he injected interferon beta to drive type 1 interferon responses, uh, and could see that within 24 hours, these ramified microglial phenotype is changing dramatically. And in response to interferon beta, we observe induction of a type 1 interferon response, and we observe highly phagocytic microglia that are engulfing DAPI-positive nuclear material. Uh, and that's quantified here, very similar to the fish. Uh, we observe these hyperphagocytic microglia. Um, so what happens when we do the opposite experiment? So we can knock out, we can prevent microglia from sensing type 1 interferons by, by knocking out the canonical type 1 interferon receptor, uh, which is called IFNAR1. Uh, it exists in a heterodimer, and this uh, IFNAR1 part of the heterodimer uh, is required for sensing of type 1 interference. And just as a quick refresher, when I mention type 1 interference, I'm referring generally, collectively, uh, to many different species of interferon alpha uh, and interferon beta. Uh, and so what happens when we knock out inter IFNAR1? Um, uh, what Fee observed uh, in these global knockout mice uh, is a very dysmorphic uh, microglial morphology. So here you're observing a Z stack through a single microglia. Uh, here is the microglial nucleus. Uh, and in these uh, white arrowheads here, what you see are three large distended microglial phagosomes. Each of them contains DAPI, suggesting that they engulfed an entire cell. Um, but each of them is kind of distended and dysmorphic. Um, suggesting that microglia from uh, type 1 interferon deficient mice that can't sense type 1 interferons have defective phagocytosis. Uh, and so we call these microglia uh, bubble microglia uh, in honor of uh, Francesca Perry, who has observed similar phenotypes uh, studying zebrafish microglia with defective phagocytosis. We defined bubble microglia as microglia whose phagosome is larger than its own nucleus, and we quantified bubble microglia overdevelopment. 
uh, what you can see here is uh, that, you know, development is kind of a stressful time. Uh, it's a stressful period for microglia and that there's a small emergence of bubble microglia, even in the healthy developing brain between postnatal days five and seven. Uh, but that when you knock out the ability of microglia to sense type one interferons, uh, the percentage of bubble microglia increases dramatically to up to 30% in some stages of development. So this is important because even though these type one interferon responsive microglia are rare at any one point in time, if you knock out this pathway, um, a large number of microglia become dysfunctional, suggesting that this is a transient state uh, that's necessary for microglial function. And we showed as well that if you knock out type 1 interferon receptor only in microglia, uh, that we phenocopy uh, this defective microglial response. Um, and so what happens to the neurons? Okay, many people said, asked us at the time, well, microglia are um, eating dead cells. You know, we know that they're involved in efferocytosis. Do you see an increase in cell death uh, or dead, you know, dead cells in the cortex when you knock out type 1 interferon signaling? Um, and the short answer is that it's not immediately obvious how cell death is being impacted by type one interferon signaling. Um, and Caroline in the lab began, uh, to, she had the idea to look at earlier stages of cell damage, right? So cell death, when we do tunnel staining, we're looking at end stage DNA damage. Uh, but you know, many situations of cell stress, even cell neuronal hyperexcitability can induce double-stranded DNA breaks. And this is what you're looking at here. So 53BP1 is a marker which is typically diffuse within the nuclei of neurons. But when double-strand DNA breaks occur, uh, it forms these very bright foci, which you can see here. Um, and Caroline found that neurons with double-strand DNA breaks, what we're calling DNA damage neurons, are enriched uh, in the same layer of the cortex where we observe bubble microglia, um, layer 5. And that when we knock out type 1 interferon responsive microglia, and when we make them blind to type 1 interferons, we see an accumulation of these DNA damage neurons. Uh, and that neuronal sensing of type 1 interferons is completely irrelevant for this process. Um, so these microglia are restricting the accumulation of DNA damage neurons. Um, and one thing you know that Carolyn wanted to understand here is, you know, what are microglia sensing uh, in order to um, affect this response? And I want to go back to remind you of what I originally told you about microglia being sensors of the extracellular environment, right? Uh, they are sensing type 1 interferons or cytokines uh, via the type 1 interferon receptor. But this is a classic example of a cytokine that is uh, amplified in a feed-forward manner by pattern recognition receptors. And in this case, the patterns that matter in these so-called antiviral immune responses are nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Um, and, you know, we thought at first, because we saw these double-strand DNA breaks, that perhaps DNA sensing uh, is what is amplifying these type 1 interferon responsive microglia. And so Caroline, uh, without testing only just the sensing of DNA, set out to systematically examine which nucleic acid receptors might be involved in amplifying these type 1 interferon responsive microglia. And to summarize a very large field, um, here I'm going to highlight three of them. One uh, is the RIG, RIG I MDA5 pathway, which via MAVS, which is a mitochondrial protein, senses double stranded RNAs. Um, a second one is TLR3, toll-like receptor 3, uh, which also senses double-stranded RNAs, but it senses them outside of the cell rather than in the cytoplasm. And a third is the CGAS sting pathway, which senses double-stranded DNA, um, also in the cytoplasm of cells. And, you know, we fully expected that CGAS sting signaling was going to be critical here because we observe these DNA damaged neurons uh, when we knock out type 1 interferon. Um, instead, uh, Caroline observed something very different. What she found uh, is that when you knock out the ability of cells to sense double-stranded RNA, we were unable to elicit these type 1 interferon responsive microglia. Uh, when you knock out the ability of cells to sense double-stranded RNA by knocking out MAVs, 
uh, we completely phenocopied this increase in bubble microglia, whereas knocking out double-strand DNA sensing via CGAS uh, did not completely phenocopy this. Uh, and furthermore, when we knock out the sensing of double-stranded RNA, um, Caroline also saw that she phenocopied this increase in DNA damaged neurons. And so double-stranded RNA sensing is essential to elicit these interferon responses. Um, and, you know, why might this be the case? Uh, while we were putting this paper together, a very interesting paper from Ha Chung Chun's lab at Columbia came out showing that neurons are one of the major cellular sources of double-stranded RNA in the whole body. They have huge amounts of double-stranded RNA. Uh, and the thinking is that, you know, neurons have very long three prime untranslated regions and that this three prime UTR generates a very complex double-stranded RNA with a lot of secondary structure and that neurons may be major triggers uh, of these uh, microglial responses. Uh, and maybe what's happening when we perform these whisker lesions is that we are damaging neurons and that they're releasing double-stranded RNA as an alarm signal to drive these microglial phagocytic responses. Um, so we wanted to understand this process uh, and how it might impact uh, brain development. Um, as uh, I'm summarizing here, layer five is where we observed most of these phenotypes, including interferon responsive microglia and DNA damaged neurons. Layer five is a very important layer in the cortex for kind of synchronizing information uh, by communicating with other regions of the sensory cortex, other modalities like um, sight and smell. Uh, and Caroline observed that when we uh, knock out type one interferon signaling and look 10 days later, there is an accumulation of excitatory neurons in layer five suggesting the possibility that this failure to engulf um, neurons during development has a long-term impact uh, and leads to accumulation of excitatory neurons. And interestingly, uh, we saw a reduction in parvalbumin-positive inhibitory neurons. Uh, so loss of this immune pathway leads to an increase in excitatory inhibitory balance. How does this affect behavior? So here I wanna show one example. Um, that Caroline observed, uh, if I can, let's see. What you're seeing here uh, is that Caroline is tickling the whiskers of the mouse using a Q-tip. And this is a purely observational study, which you can perform even on juvenile mice. This is a 15 day old mouse. Um, and when you tickle the whiskers of the mouse, um, we can measure its kind of tactile sensitivity, its response. And this mouse is very calm and it's not bothered by this perturbation. Uh, but when we knock out type one interferon signaling, uh, Caroline began to notice, you know, and these experiments are all blinded, of course, that some of the mice would get very upset. They would try to bite the stick. They would chase the stick around the cage. Uh, and this is what we call increased tactile hypersensitivity. Uh, and this is a phenotype that was driven by, um, um, that was increased when we knock out type one interferon signaling. Uh, and also uh, increased when we knock it out only in the myeloid lineage. So this is kind of the model that um, I would like to uh, emphasize in terms of how type 1 interferons are impacting microglial function to impact brain homeostasis. Uh, we think that double-stranded RNA from neurons is acting as a stress signal to drive and exacerbate the emergence of these interferon-responsive microglia, which can then selectively engulf some neurons. Um, and the source of the cytokine itself, which I didn't discuss, um, is something we're still trying to figure out. But we think that very low levels, what we call tonic levels of type 1 interferon signaling, just enough to tickle the interferon receptor, are enough to put microglia in this poised state uh, where they're primed to respond to these neuronal stress signals. Uh, and this pathway uh, is critical, as we showed, for excitatory inhibitory balance, uh, to restrict tactile hypersensitivity. Um, and I don't wanna over-interpret this data or anthropomorphize, but I will point out that EI imbalance and tactile sensitivity are, are very canonical features of neurodevelopmental disorders uh, including autism spectrum disorders, right? We know that um, kids with autism will often wear headphones and their parents will cut the tags off of their clothes because they have a very heightened tactile sensitivity. 
Um, and so we are thinking a lot about how we might begin to model how early life uh, immune perturbation would impact the development of the brain. Uh, and just to give you one example here, of course, viral infection is one of the main triggers of type 1 interferon responses. They are major drivers of these post-viral neurological syndromes that we observe in adulthood. Uh, and we now know that um, viral infection, uh, first wave infection with a SARS-CoV-2 virus, as was shown in this very large study from the UK Biobank, um, and this is in people that were um, infected with COVID before the vaccine um, and uh, imaged before and after COVID infection, uh, it was clear that there was a loss in the size of the brain. Um, could there be an elimination of neurons in this setting? We don't know. Uh, but uh, we also observed that in the setting of a mouse model of SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, the interferon response of microglia were surrounding virally infected neurons. Uh, this is just a model. Uh, since that time, we have many better uh, mo models of SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's not clear whether the virus is actually replicating in the brain or not in human disease. Uh, so this is a major area of interest for our lab. Uh, and in the meantime, we've been refocusing on early life viral infection, uh, studying very common pathogens uh, that uh, children are infected by and recovered from. Uh, and so Richard in the lab, working together with Raul Andino's lab, uh, is developing a model whereby mice are infected with a virus in early life. They get sick and then they get better. Um, and you can see that during the period of peak infection, there's a robust interferon response in very uh, stereotyped regions in the brain. Uh, and in those regions, we can observe highly interferon responsive microglia that are highly phagocytic and engulfing whole cells. Uh, and so what Richard wants to study is whether these transient interferon responses that happen during viral infection have long-term impacts uh, for adult behavior. Uh, and more broadly, I just want to end by saying that we are not the first to observe interferon responsive microglia. In fact, ERMs or interferon responsive microglia are a canonical microglial subset, um, not only in mouse models, but in human models as well. Uh, you can see here uh, an analysis that Leah did where we looked at our uh, interferon responsive signature across multiple different uh, single cell sequencing um, data from many other groups around the world. And you can see that mouse models of amyloid pathology have a high enrichment of interferon responsive microglia, obviously viral infections. Somewhat surprisingly to us, glioblastoma is one of the top inducers of interferon responses, um, as well as stroke, uh, which induces very robust interferon responsive microglia. Um, and Jonathan Weinstein's lab, which has a lot of expertise uh, in the induction of interferon responsive microglia after stroke, um, has been performing studies of stroke. Uh, and here's an image of uh, a middle cerebral artery occlusion um, analyzed by Sarah Anderson in my lab in collaboration with the Weinstein lab. And you can basically see where the stroke occurred based on the pattern of interferon responses. And if you zoom in, you can see um, a ton of interferon responsive microglia within the stroke lesion. Uh, so we're very interested more broadly in understanding how interferon responsive microglia are affecting a range uh, of brain pathologies. Um, I just wanna thank my lab. I thanked um, all of the um, people whose work I showed you today along the way, but um, I, my lab, um, everybody really helps each other, uh, collaborates with each other, and contributes to these studies. Um, and um, all of them are, are listed here. Um, and thank you very much to my funding sources. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And it was an impressive talk with a lot of data to think about. So in while well, people is still coming back, please turn on your cameras for the questions. I have to say that I made a mistake and the questions are gonna be handled by Giorgio. Hi, Giorgio Corsi, he's there. Um, he's gonna be start, he's gonna start reading the questions that we have from the audience. Thanks, Giorgio. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Anna, for the great talk. We already have three questions in the chat. I will start with the first one by Joanna Guedes. 
I'm sorry for me, for any mispronunciation of the names. Uh, the first question is, what is the molecular origin of bubble microglia downstream IF NAR1? How does the signaling pathway in microglia defines the huge phagosome? How does this signaling pathway in microglia define the huge phagosome? Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, I'm gonna um, answer the question in the way that I'm understanding it, uh, which is how does type one interferon drive microglial phagocytosis? Like what is it actually doing to help microglia engulf whole cells better? Um, and if that's the question, Joanna, feel free to correct me. Um, I would say that that's a very critical question that we don't know the answer to yet, um, but I could speculate and I could give you some hypotheses that we're thinking about right now. So first of all, type one interferon responses are evolved to, to eliminate viruses from mammalian cells, from, from eukaryotic cells. Um, and viruses are basically expressing um, all they are is a little packet of nucleic acids, right? DNA and RNA. Uh, and one of the ways that interferon responses do that is by making um, interferon responses do this is by making enzymes that can chop up DNA and RNA. And so one hypothesis is that when a microglia eats an entire cell, uh, one of the main phagocytic cargo that it has to deal with, unlike when it's eating synapses, it has to deal with all of the DNA inside of the nucleus. Uh, so how does it deal with that, right? Interferon responses can induce enzymes like DNases that will chop up the DNA, make it more digestible, and help the microglia to digest that cargo. So this is one of the things that I would speculate uh, is how type 1 interferon responsive, uh, responses are helping microglia to phagocytose. And when you knock out these responses, they can no longer handle that nucleic acid cargo and they form these large bubbles of basically undigested phagocytic material, which, as I pointed out to you, has DAPI in them. In other words, it has DNA inside that hasn't been digested. Thank you. We proceed with the second question by Carmen Romero Molina. Nice talk. Can you further comment on the role of uh, interferon microglia in neurodegenerative diseases such as Sanders disease? In your opinion, would that uh, microglia state be beneficial? That's a very important question. I love that question. So I want to say that there are uh, many groups working on aspects of this question. So including, for example, Li Gan and Wei Kao. Um, and, and the Cal lab, for example, has directly shown that if you knock out type one interferon responses in microglia, um, it can uh, impact animal models of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and CGAS stink signaling has uh, also been shown to be involved. Um, we ourselves haven't uh, worked um, on neurodegeneration. I think you could imagine that it would be protective to get rid of terminally damaged cells. Um, but it kind of depends what microglia are doing in that context. Are they helping to phagocytose um, um, amyloid plaques, which often actually have um, nucleic acids inside of them? Or are they impacting uh, the phagocytosis of neurons and thereby contributing to neuronal death? Or both. Thank you. Thank you. So the uh, the next question is by Julia Albertini. Beautiful talk. Will would the interferon response in microglia response be specific to phagocytosis of neurons, or could it be a marker of highly uh, phagocytic microglia also in other contexts such as phagocytosis of uh, IA beta in Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. So that's a related question. I would say that. Um, any kind of nucleic acid trigger, whether it's DNA or RNA, will um, elicit type 1 interferon responses. And so all we can say for sure is that these um, type 1 interferon responsive microglia across these different pathological settings um, are all responding to nucleic acids of some sort. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the engulfment of a whole cell, as we showed during development. It is possible that amyloid plaques um, are also triggering this response because uh, many people have observed that, that, well, we've observed as well, like, you know, you can actually see poly D, 
poly T signal inside of plaques. Uh, nucleic acids could get stuck inside the plaques. I would say that um, as a field, though, we do have to make the clear hypothesis that when we see these interferon responsive microglia, they are responding to nucleic acid material of some sort. Whether that's coming from a whole cell nucleus or whether it means that, you know, there is a lot of uh, mitochondrial RNA being released, uh, whether it means that myelin has a lot of um, RNAs that are elicited because of um, oligodendrocyte processes having RNA in them. Um, we don't know for sure. I think those are possible, but we have to assume that there's a nucleic acid trigger. So the one thing which I would argue does not trigger a type 1 interferon response is simply uh, the engulfment of synaptic material without a substantial amount of nucleic acids. Thank you. Uh, next question is by uh, uh, Juan Duarte. You observed that there's a natural degrees of IFT and 3 plus microglia, positive microglia during uh, typical development. Do you think this is due to a turnover in the cell population or is it due to uh, a downregulation of this phenotype? If so, did you observe if uh, these cells or population remained as prime subset of microglia that might have additional effects further in life? So, yeah, so if I understood the question, um, what we observed is that there is a transient need for these microglia at postnatal day five in the developing cortex. And that later on, uh, when we look at microglia from these mice, global knockouts, conditional knockouts, whatever, they look totally fine. Um, it's not that they aren't, um, that microglia aren't competent to respond to type one interference later in development. It's that they're necessary at that particular stage. You know, maybe, you know, what we hypothesize is that some excitatory neurons are eliminated uh, via a non-apoptotic mechanism at that particular stage of development. And therefore those microglia are particularly necessary at that time. Um, any other challenge or stress uh, that might elicit um, nucleic acid release at other stages of development in other brain regions um, might uh, be predicted to elicit those microglia. I will say if we knock out type 1 interferon and look um, at various regions of the brain at postnatal day 5, we can see dysmorphic microglia. So uh, we think it's important at this particular developmental stage during healthy development, but they may also be important uh, under what we would call stressful conditions at other stages of development and in other disease contexts. Next question by Amy Guo. Amazing talk. May I ask if you have tried to uh, interfere on beta injection or interfere on uh, alpha beta receptor knockout in microglia in adults or disease, disease model? Uh, do you see any phenotypes or, or uh, microglia only have those bubble phenotypes in development? Um. We are only beginning our studies of adulthood, so I, I couldn't comment too much on that now. Um, but it's a very interesting question. Okay. Uh, since, uh, Georgia, since the next question is from Fede, and Fede is in the audience, and is one of our groups in the group. Maybe Fede, you wanna yeah. ask him, your, ask uh, Anna yourself? Yeah, um, my question was regarding the, the, the extracellular matrix papers. Since the, since the preliminary nets, they surround mostly inhibitory neurons. Uh, I, I wanted your opinion if you think microglia can also remodel the matrix around the excitatory spines or dendrites. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So I really, really want to emphasize this point. You know, many of us, when we hear extracellular matrix, we think perineural nets. Um, Perineural nets are simply um, a phenomenon that is observed when we stain the brain with this lectin called WFA that happens to stain a glycosylation motif that happens to be highly enriched around parvalbumin positive interneurons. Um, but perineural nets are by no means the only kind of extracellular matrix. Uh, and thank you for pointing that out. You know, as we develop more markers for the extracellular matrix. I showed you only one of them, Agarcan, right? We can see that there is this diffuse extracellular matrix around all of the spines. And I didn't show you a high resolution image, but 
completely surrounding the spines and localizing its synapses in the dentate gyrus. And those are not paranormal nuts. That's a different kind of extracellular matrix. Microglia can remodel that. That is our model of what's happening in the hippocampus. And I suspect as we begin to develop more markers, uh, we'll see that the extracellular matrix is absolutely everywhere in different forms. And it's not just around inhibitory neurons. Thank you. Next question is by uh, Bente Finsen. Great talk. Can you comment on whether or not bubble microglia reflect a lysosomal failure in microglia? Bubble microglia reflect a lysosomal failure. Um, generally, um, I would say yes. So, for example, <clears throat> um, but I think it just, there's so many steps of phagocytosis that uh, what we would like to do is be more precise about that, right? So, um, when Francesca first described bubble microglia, she was referring to a knockout in the fish that impacted something called the gastrosome, right? Which is the, the first step of when it's phagocytosed before it's fusing with the lysosome. Um, and when we're studying bubble microglia, we don't really know which stage of the phagocytic pathway is impaired. We think that the um, compartment is a little bit acidified. Uh, and so lysosomal dysfunction, I think, yeah, the question is what, what aspect of lysosomal dysfunction? Um, so our hypothesis is that, you know, one job of the lysosome is not only to digest proteins, but to digest nucleic acids. Uh, and if that's the case, we should be able to identify enzymes that are specific to that process. Uh, next question is by Evangelia Kiriakidu. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I was wondering whether interferon beta signaling is enough to induce the engulfment of whole cell, or they also need a stress signal coming from neurons. In the first case, could be uh, could peripheral cues activate the interferon beta pathway and microglia phagocytosis of non-damaged neurons? I mean, that's the million-dollar question. I think, right? Could we assassinate neurons uh, with this immune cue? Um, I mean, when we inject interferon beta, absolutely, we can see uh, that microglia engulf whole neurons. Um, why is that not a good experiment? Uh, when we inject interferon beta, of course, we may be causing inflammation in many other ways. We may be causing the neurons to become stressed. Uh, and so we are really giving both signals at once, right? Uh, so one experiment one could potentially do. Uh, and uh, for example, Marco Prince's lab made a Flox allele of USP18, which is an intracellular uh, driver of interferon responses. So we could cause only the microglia to become interferon responsive without affecting the rest of the circuit. Uh, and then we could address that question. Uh, sorry, I'm going just to interrupt a second, just to say we are not going to, please don't write any more questions. It's already 6 p.m. We have still four or five on the list. So I think that's enough for Anna. So we, we're just going to finish reading the ones that are already written, okay? Thank okay, you. so next one is by Alicia Gonzalez. Did you observe if stubby, uh, stubby spines density change in uh, IL-33 in knockout mice? Stubby, stu stubby spines, is that your question? Yes, did you observe if stubby spine density change in uh, interleukin-33 knockout? Yeah, um, so, right, people have characterized dendritic spines into these many different morphological phenotypes. Um, I think we felt in that study that we couldn't definitively with confidence assign this particular spine morphology of stubby versus filopodial. In that study, we were specifically focusing on spine head filopodia. So um, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. A good question. Next one, Brian Campos Salazar. Are there any example of DSRNA, DSDNA viruses use microglia as host and overcome those interferon mediated responses? Side question, would gene edit editing with guided SSRNAs may, uh, may impose a challenge for microglia? Mm -hmm. um, so as to the first part of that question, uh, whether there are examples of microglia serving as hosts for viruses, I mean, I... I don't know the answer. I mean, there may be people studying this in more depth. I would say, honestly, one of the first things that made me interested in neuroimmunology, and this was many years ago, uh, was the idea that HIV, which is a retrovirus, um, could uh, somehow have a host within microglia. But 
that's a long story, which, um, you know, again, I, I, I think it's possible. I don't know. I think generally speaking, uh, immune cells are very good at and not being hosts for viruses. That's kind of their job, right? Um, and as to the second part of the question, whether um, like guide RNAs or kind of some of the um, nucleic acid tools that we're beginning to use to manipulate cells could induce interferon responses, I think um, that's a great question and it's something that we should definitely consider. So for example, you know, we've used lentiviruses uh, in one of our studies in our extracellular matrix study to manipulate pathways, but the lentivirus response is very immunogenic and it kind of changed some of our baseline synaptic features. So adeno-associated viruses don't seem to do that nearly as much. Uh, there was a very interesting study showing that some Crees that people use to manipulate microglia, this is specifically the CX3CR1 Littman Cree, um, induces interferon responses itself. Um, Crees can excise pieces of the genome. Those pieces of the genome can be immunogenic and induce type 1 interferon responses. So absolutely, those are things we should be thinking about. Last question. Can you give an outlook of what uh, your presented rules of microglia mean in models of neuropsychiatric diseases like schizophrenia, where other areas uh, uh, of the brain are affected in relation to major histocompatibility uh, complex class one? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, if I understood the question, it had to do with what's kind of my outlook on microglial roles in psychiatric diseases. Uh, and we'll focus on schizophrenia because I would say that is the one psychiatric disease where we have both epidemiologic data, right? That maternal viral infection or history of severe infection increases the risk. And two, we have genetic data, right? Um, the involvement of the class one MHC locus. So um, I think that there's a lot more we need to understand about that. Um, there's been intriguing work suggesting that um, C4 complement receptor, which is within the class one MHC locus, um, that would be a protein coding gene. There's been some fine mapping done of C4, suggesting that it may be related to schizophrenia. Um, so that's one possibility, which is very exciting. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, um, geneticists call the class one MHC locus, I forgot what they call it, like the death of genetics, the um, stepchild of, of, gene of immunogenetics. It's, it's difficult to know what it means because the class one MHC locus is so variable, right? Every human population that is dealing with different endogenous pathogens evolves uh, different um, variability in the class one MHC locus. So there's what's called linkage disequilibrium uh, where it's different like all the time, right? Um, so what does it mean? I think I have sort of backed up and I just say, okay, well, I see the class one MHC locus is involved. Um, that tells me something is different about immune responses, that immune responses are variability in immune responses are impacting the expression of that phenotype in some way. Um, but whether that's because of the actual genes in that locus uh, or some way in which that person's immune system responds to their local environment, uh, we don't know yet. Um, and honestly, okay. whether it's microglia or peripheral immune responses, we also don't know. So, all right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, next question by Fabia Filippello. Uh, I'm wondering whether uh, interferon microglia substrate is specific of layer five or it is observed in other regions of the brain. Did you perform any special transcriptomics in your model to see where interferon one microglia state is upregulated? Um, we are performing spatial transcriptomics, yes. Um, it's a little maybe... Um, Puff just by spatial transcriptomics to see glia and as much resolution as we would like. But um, so I don't know that it's necessary for that particular question. What I would say is um, when we knock out type 1 interferons, we see dysmorphic microglia all over the brain at postnatal day five. Um, in a healthy brain, when we perform the whisker plucking, we see interferon responsive microglia only in layer five. Um, that doesn't mean that different stressors in different contexts might not induce interferon responsive microglia. Uh, we were just very lucky to find this particular brain region where there's some kind of developmental stress that elicits these cells. We think that this interferon responsive microglial state is very quick. It's very rare. These, these cells are very rare. Uh, when we do the whisker plucking and we look in layer five of the cortex, 
it's a very small subset. We would never notice them if we weren't using this marker. Um, and we have made um, new interferon reporter tools uh, where we hope to be able to address that question uh, in more detail. Okay. The last question for today is again uh, by Joanna Guedes. In physiological conditions, no changes in whiskers. There are also other neurons. There are also neurons that need to be eliminated by microglia mediated engulfment of all cells. Is interferon responsive microglia also responsible for the elimination of these neurons? Um, sorry, which neurons? Neurons uh, that are not related uh, uh, to changes in whiskers, if I get the question correctly. I, if you oh, want, I can see. read the question again. In physiological... No, that's okay, okay. okay. That's all right. Yeah, so we don't know. Actually, we don't know which neurons are being eliminated. Uh, and we don't even know that the neurons being eliminated are the neurons with the double-stranded DNA breaks. All we have is this correlation between this kind of stressed neuronal phenotype and the emergence of these cells. So that's a great question and something we'll have to continue to look into. Uh, as soon as a cell is eliminated, basically as soon as the phagocytic cup closes, all of the proteins are gone. And it's very difficult at that point to know what that cell was before it was engulfed. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I know we grill you with questions, but this is a sign of how much interest it, what, there is in your research. So thank you very much awesome. for your patience. Thank you, everybody. We were over 160 people at some point. So this was one of the largest meetings we ever had. So thank you very much and see you in a month. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody in the team. Bye. 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 See you. Bye.